So welcome to our breakout session on your clarinet questions answered. Really, um, we thought it would be nice to have a room where people could ask about any clarinet challenges they're having, and I'm going to try and give you as much support as I can. Um, Lucy just popped in saying she's just new to clarinet. So Lucy, how long have you been playing for? I've been playing since January and I've been doing all your courses. So thank you very much for sending me those. And um, I'm just, you know, learning the basics of all of the different things. I, I could play a few tunes, but not a lot. Uh, so I need to get better, but I'm doing everything that you've advised. I do recording and uh, look at myself and look at my embouchure. And I'm now trying synthetic reeds. Oh, great. Is that working well for you? Yeah, well, I'm I'm up in the mountains at the moment, and um, I'm nine and a half thousand feet, and the cane rain, the cane reed, I could just couldn't do it all. I couldn't even get a note out, so I was very frustrated. Yeah, at high altitude, cane reeds will feel really hard to blow. You have to go. Yeah. Um, and Sheila, I see your hair as well. Just so I can sort of give maximum value, if you want to unmute yourself, um, what's your sort of area of focus? Um, okay, so I have kind of an old clarinet. It's a student clarinet of Bunting. But are you hearing me, by the way? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. I see. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, for a, quite a while now, I've been needing a new mouthpiece, and I'm just wondering, when you go out to buy a mouthpiece, like, how do you know that it's it's going to fit into the barrel, you know, that you have of, of your clarinet? And also, if you could make like. I, I mean, if the mouthpiece is under a hundred dollars, is that something that you shouldn't even, you know, it's just not good enough or, or what is your opinion about mouthpieces, different ones? You know, I don't want to spend a fortune. So if you could just, yeah, advise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hello, Helen, welcome. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about mouthpieces because I think that applies to all of us, whatever level we are. Personally, I think the mouthpiece is probably, aside from the reed, the most important piece of equipment on your clarinet. I'd rather yeah. play with my really good mouthpiece, which was, it's about 150 US, the one I use, and like, you know, a $400 clarinet than my $8,000 clarinet and a really cheap mouthpiece. Cause I think it's, it affects our sound and our response. Yeah. So mouthpiece is really important. Um, ideally, if you can play test it, mouthpieces are one of those things that I think because there's so much variety in the shape of our faces, our jaw, our oral cavity, it's it's really different for each person. So I've never seen one mouthpiece that works well for everybody. You know, there's certainly some really good ones that are definitely a step up from the basic, you know, plastic one that comes with most clarinets, like the one with your Bundy clarinet. They usually don't even bother trying to make it very good because they know that odds are people are gonna upgrade the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. So it definitely does make a difference. Um, so if you can play the mouthpiece, what it will do is you can almost tell instantly if it's a good one for you. You know, there's a couple things I would say. Um, different will, it, will they all fit though on the barrel that I have? They should. It's, it's okay. barrels are intended to be standard size because okay. there's no one that people are going to switch mouthpieces. Okay. So in your price range, sort of the hundred dollar ish range, um, you know, there's a lot of really good Van Doren and, and, and Dadara mouthpieces. They probably, though, are more like the 130 range. So um, there is the one I play on is called the Bakun Vocalese. And I noticed they had a sale on their website for like $105. I don't know if that's what is it again? It's a, uh, it's called the company is Bakun, B-A-C-K-U-N. So if you go to Bakun Musical Services, it's called the Vocalese. And there's the Vocalese. The vocalese. Yeah, I can write it in the chat. I mean, that's going to okay. go to everybody, but that's okay. I'll I'll put it uh, in the chat. There's three sizes, but there's one called a G, which is the middle size. So like if you're just not in a position to go into a music store and test things, um, that that's kind of the middle of the road one. It works for most people. Uh, if you do have a music store in your area, hello, welcome. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are joining us, we're talking about mouthpieces. If you do have a music store that lets you play test them, what I do when I play test mouthpieces is I bring reeds with me that I know are a little bit on the softer side and a little bit on the stiffer side. You know, sometimes if we have our box of reeds, some work differently because different cuts of mouthpieces require different strengths. So 
if you just come in with one read, you might not be giving a mouthpiece a fair test if it's the wrong size for that mm. particular mouthpiece. So if it feels hard to blow, then you go, oh, I better pull out this slightly lighter reed just to test it with. Um, you should test tonguing from low notes and high notes. Sometimes you put one on and it's like, whoa, this sound is beautiful. And then you try articulating and it just feels really hard, right? So ideally you want one that sounds good on low notes, sounds good on high notes. It feels easy for you to blow. You like the sound. It's a good idea to have a tuner there because if it sounds amazing, but as you're going through the pitches all over the place that you, you can't fix that. So that would be a nightmare. So will let you test out different mouthpieces. I mean, they'll let you try them out. Most of them do. I mean, even in this time of COVID, I think they do. And they put them into a sterilization bath and quarantine them once you try them. Uh, but okay. most, most mainstream music stores will because they, they acknowledge that it's a very personal thing. And, and I've heard of stores even now who are shipping you, I guess if you give them a credit card deposit or something, they'll send you a box of three to try, you know, and then you try and you keep the one you like best and you send back the other two. Um, okay. so yeah, I, I do think it's worthwhile. Um, so in your hundred dollar range, like as I said, if that vocally is on sale, is in that price range, that's when I would recommend. Um, it just might be worth your time to consider upping that to, to the to include the Van Doren BD mouthpieces and the M13s and stuff like that and the Daddario professional ones because I, I haven't shopped lately, but they're usually around 130, 140. And the difference in quality over the $60 mouthpiece just might yeah. be worth it to you. There's yeah. a difference, big difference. Okay. I, I really think, I really think it's worth it. It's, okay. yeah. and, but again, it has to be the one that fits your face. Um, but it definitely makes a huge difference. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. So welcome everybody. Um, uh, what I would love to hear kind of maybe briefly, those of you who just joined us, um, we'll take a question from each person and Lucy's a relative beginner. So I wanted to also, before we wrap up, I'm going to share some things that'll be helpful to her. Um, but let me ask Helen, Karen, and Land, who just joined us, do either of you have any questions you'd like me to address while you're here? <coughs> well, Land, why don't you go ahead? If I'm hopefully I'm saying your name right. Ilan, Ilan. Yeah. Me, I think, with the I at the beginning. All right. Yeah, so I recently bought a secondhand wooden clarinet. And um, I suppose one of the things I really need to bear in mind in keeping it in good condition. So a couple of recommendations I have. Um, wooden clarinets are affected by humidity changes and you don't want the wood to dry out. There's a very inexpensive product. I'm going to just hold it up so that, uh, hold on, I'm trying to make myself bigger here. Oh, I can't quite do that. Okay, well, I don't know. I'm holding it up, but I'll also describe it. This is by a company called Boveda, B-O-V-E-D-A. It's a humidity pack. It's called three-way, two-way humidity control. 49%. I'm going to write that in the chat. I know it's going to go to everyone and other people will wonder what we're talking about, but um, they're originally, they were made by guitar players who have wooden guitars in their cases because uh, if a guitar dries out and warps, it can really wreck the guitar. So um, I just, let's see, 49%. I'm writing it in the chat. So if those of you open up the chat, you'll see it. Uh, what I do with these, so the size of this one, they make little ones and large ones. I think this is the larger one. It's about the size of my, slightly smaller than my hand. Um, it was Maury Bakun who recommended this to me, and he said that you take it out of its plastic wrap. They last, they'll regulate your humidity for about three months. So usually I date it, and I kind of go with solstices and equinoxes is, is my rough. So, you know, at solstice, I'll switch more. That's how I remember to do it every three months but I also date them. If that goes in your case, that really helps to regulate humidity. Um, if you see signs on the wood that it's drying out, and here's some of the signs. If your clarinet has rings on the joint and the rings get loose, that's a warning sign that your clarinet is dry. Sometimes if you just look at the surface of it, you know, there's kind of natural grain in the wood. If that grain is starting to look deeper, you know, almost like little hairline cracks, that's a warning sign. And so along with things like the humidity packs, then you can oil the wood. And um, it's also recommended you oil the bore of a wooden clarinet maybe every three months. So usually you take a, a, a separate swab 
and you just sprinkle a few drops of the oil on it and swab it through a few times. And there are companies that make bore oil. This? Uh, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yep. And uh, so you just do that every few months. If the outside is starting to look really dry, sometimes I'll just put the tiniest bit on my finger and just rub it on the wood. You don't want to get it on the pads, but I'll rub it. And if it like soaks in and it looks all dry within, you know, an hour or two, then I'll put another light coat on. Um, the other thing with wooden clarinets is don't expose them to extreme temperature and especially quick temperature changes. So sometimes like this room I play in, gets quite cold in winter time. So if I pull my clarinet out of the case, I can tell the wood is really cold. If you blow hot air inside a cold instrument, the inside will start to swell up and it'll push the outside apart and crack it. So you warm up the outside of the clarinet before you blow hot air into it. Um, and you shouldn't leave it in a car in the sunshine, right? Where the inside of your car might get super hot. Um, if you do, then let it return to temperature gradually. But uh, yeah, in general, avoid extreme temperature and, and dry humidity is the main thing. Michelle, can I just um, uh, just just to say uh, I I used to bring my wooden one up at nine and a half thousand feet and um, it would just dry. So I now on the ebonite one up in the mountains, but I'm fine at six thousand feet with the wooden. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a nice way to balance it. And I think, too, um, I think, too, Lucy, if you had the humidity packs in your case, your, your wooden one would probably be okay where you are because that's where you're in the case, you know, most of the time, right? So I think yes. that probably helps it. Um, Perfect. If, yeah, Alain, does that, does that Alain, answer your... Yeah, I think I'll get one of those humidity packs. Thanks. Yeah, I think I just ordered mine on Amazon or something and that particular, like I got a box of, well, I've got a lot of clarinets, so I just got like a box of 10, but you can buy them individually or you can buy you know, three packs or a whole bunch. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So I see Helen and Karen, um, you've joined us. If you have any particular questions, I'm happy to help you as well. And I want to spend, oh, Helen, I see you talking. You just might need to unmute yourself if you know how to do that. You look for the little microphone yeah. picture. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I've only been learning a couple of years. And uh, my clarinet teacher is suggesting that I upgrade. Um, uh, she'd like me to get a wooden clarinet. And I just wonder, because I haven't been playing very long, whether I should uh, do a, a step in between and go for a new mouthpiece. Um, and then I could presumably use that on a wooden clarinet as well. That's usually my recommendation is find a really good mouthpiece first and you absolutely can take that mouthpiece with you when you upgrade your instrument later. Mm. And what, what kind of plastic clarinet do you have? Do you know? A Yamaha. Oh, okay. So Yamaha are excellent plastic clarinets. They play really well in tune. The key work is great. I've even had students who got the professional mouthpiece and then they got a really nice wooden clarinet barrel. You know, lots of people make them. Uh, like in the hundred to three hundred dollar range depending how fancy you want to go and because that's close close to your reed in the mouthpiece sometimes a yamaha plastic clarinet with a professional barrel can sound as good as many of the intermediate level wooden clarinets out of the box and you know for considerably less investment of money mm -hmm. um and for a lot of people that sounds good enough for what they're doing uh but the mouthpiece is more important than the clarinet so I definitely right. think that would be a good next step for you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Um, Karen, did you have anything in particular you wanted to ask while you're here? I think you're shaking your head, but oh. Yes. Yeah, I'm clicking away, but not in the right place. Um, I have a question about reeds and intonation. So as you know, I've been playing for almost four years, I guess. And initially, I wasn't really that that focused too much on my intonation. I was just trying to figure out more of the mechanics and getting my air and, and my fingers in the right place. But now that I'm getting better, I'm focusing more on intonation, and I've realized that it's, it's not being so good. Can different reads affect your intonation? Sometimes when I put on a read, it, it's... Um, it's different. So I'm just curious about that. And, and is that a potential sign that the reed is on its way out of useful life? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, I do think reads can affect our intonation. Um, one example is most reads, as we plan them, get softer, right? They get lighter, whether it's a cane read or a synthetic read. And when a read starts to get too soft, it will tend to play flat. Well, yeah, it'll tend to play flat. But on the other hand, um, if we're ever experiencing a note that feels like it might not be coming out or we're going to lose it, then we tend to react and bite a bit. So sometimes when a read's too soft, it will tend to wimp out on our high notes, which might cause us to bite, which then could squeeze the pitch up. So so an old read generally makes us uh, flatter. The other thing I experienced when I, I switched to Leger European cut reads, and um, I did it because I wanted to see if I could make them sound good. I didn't like the way they sounded, but my colleague said, do it for a month. And my pitch went really flat for the first two weeks that I was playing on them. And I'm not sure why, you know, I put on shorter barrels, I tried to adjust to it, but once I kind of figured out how to get the sound I wanted on those, which took me a few weeks, my pitch tendencies completely normalized back to what they had been on cane, uh, which is that I tend to play sharp. So I had to go back to my extra long barrels. So. Uh, I've heard many people say that when they first switch to the, I don't know if it's all synthetic reads or just the Legere European cut, they find their pitch is a bit lower. And uh, and I think whatever I shifted, embouchure and airwise, to get the sound I wanted, then cancelled out that tendency. Um, does any of that ring true with what you're noticing, Karen? I'm finding I'm still quite sharp. Um, so I got a longer barrel, but I don't think I got it long enough. Okay. Um, so yeah, I just, I need to spend some more time, I think with my tuner and just doing, uh, doing long notes and going through the scale and trying to figure out because parts of the scale I'm, I'm quite sharp and then other parts I get flat. So, um, just figuring out that part. Yeah, the standard barrel that comes with B-flat clarinets is usually 65 millimeters, sometimes 66. Um, I play on 67 and 68, which which is quite a bit longer. And many people do. Ricardo Morales plays on 68. So I think some of us, just the way our face is built, we play higher. It doesn't mean we're biting. It's just the way, and you know, whatever. It's our mouthpiece. So... Um, my rule of thumb is, is if you're pulling more than one millimeter, a millimeter is about 10 cents on the tuner. You know, the tuner gives you those little numbers, like you're 15 cents sharp. If you're consistently more than 10 cents sharp, then you need a millimeter longer on your barrel. So that might be worth looking at, Karen, is just the numbers. Kind of, you know, take your flattest note, and if that's more than 10 cents sharp, then you could go up a full millimeter. A lot of the great barrel manufacturers, like like the Bakun barrels and Clark Phobes and all these wonderful craftsmen, you know, Brad Bain make them so that they come in in 0.5. So you could get uh, 66 millimeters or 66 and a half or you know 67 and a half, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so just I think we have about five minutes and then Jessica's going to bring you all back into the main room. So Lucy, I just wanted to ask you, you were the first one in here. You said you're a relative beginner and that reading that sheet music was tricky because your eyes aren't used to sight reading quickly. Um, one thought I had about that for anyone who has trouble sight reading, we get better at sight reading when our brain has learned patterns. And I think it's really important as part of our practice routine, we're regularly doing patterns. And what I mean by patterns are there's finger patterns. So some of those exercises Al led us through were sort of scale and arpeggio patterns. And if we if we just take one pattern, like a one minute warm up, like one of the lines Al had, and we play it five or six times, part of our brain starts to make it feel on autopilot. And then when we encounter those same patterns in other pieces of music, we can sight read it easily. So reading notes is one of those patterns. And if you're new to note reading, taking the music that you already own, a good exercise I used to do with little kids was I'd point to the note, they would finger it, and then say the note name out loud. And at first they might be like looking at the fingering chart, ah, oh, that's an A. So it took two or three seconds to answer. Yeah. But by the time we got through the whole page, it's amazing how quickly the brain picks it up. They're going A, F, G. Uh, D, you know, and by the end of the page, it's there. So a little bit of that would help you. The other patterns we have are articulation patterns. So, you know, 
ta 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 ya ta 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 ya ta ya ta 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 ya ta 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 like practice articulation patterns rhythm patterns are huge for sight reading if you don't have a system for like clapping counting learning rhythms that can make a huge difference to how easily we can play new music so i really think as part of our our practice regimen we need to be taking patterns and learning them and practicing perfect because that. i i i've always um kind of um done pieces by by ear and now i'm switching to music i feel nervous and it's stopping me from playing because i feel nervous about learning the actual music uh, but i know to get to the next stage i need to really read music it can feel intimidating. The good news is it's actually really not that hard to learn. You know, <laughs> you can read words on a page. It's the exact same brain process. You know, there was a time, I, I, this is an example I love to have. Uh, I, I don't, I can't do a whiteboard with you guys. Um, but if, you know, there was a time where you saw the word D-O-G and you had to go D -a -g, D -a -g, D-O-G, D-O-G, right? <laughs> That's how you learn to read. Now your brain looks at it and nice. goes, dog, right? So our brain has put the sounds together into patterns and it's the same thing with reading music and learning rhythms. So our brain's really good at learning how to read. You, you just you just need like a practice to learn that. Yeah, I need the, I need the confidence, I think, because I can, I can, you know, read it on the actual page, but reading it and doing it, I think, oh, yeah. I can't do it. So, so using the dog formula, like, do it in mm -hmm. little bits take one bar and just repeat that bar a few times and you could be amazed after five or six times if it's one bar you can do it five to ten times in less than a minute and you'll be like wow i know it and perfect you thank you times and you're going to find your rate of learning goes up super fast all right i think jessica's going to end this soon but we get 30 seconds notice so I, I could fit in another question does anyone have another one while we're here i i did ask you about reads i'm uh <clears throat> I keep trying to use a, a three um, and I find uh, I always use it for warm ups and that is absolutely fine. But when I start playing anything fast, I find I get out of breath and I give up and I go on to a two, back to a two and a half. And I've been doing this for a while and it just seems <laughs> I'm never going to get there. <laughs> so, well, I have a couple thoughts on that. When we're playing a read that's a little bit stronger, like the three, it requires slightly faster air to, to vibrate the reed. And the bonus of that is usually that more strong reed gives us a fuller, richer tone, right? So that's why over time we do go a little mm. bit stiffer. When we hit something hard, our brain kind of goes into survival mode. It's like, yikes, and oh, this might not sound good. And our, without really consciously doing it, we tend to back off the air so that no one can hear that it doesn't sound so good. It's just our natural instinct, right? And then as soon as our air is wimpy, it's going to sound airy and fuzzy and we're going to feel tired. So it could be that. So one way to test that is just take a really short bit of the hard thing, like two beats or something, and just say, if I really focus on doing this with super fast air, how does it sound and how does it feel? Um, but the other thing is, too, to support that stronger read, when we start blowing with faster air, it does put more strain on our mouth muscles. And so um we get tired so it might mm -hmm. be that you're doing your warm-up and it's just coincidence that by the time you got 15 20 minutes in your session your lips kind of for now have had enough and then the softer read just allows you to keep playing so you know over your goal over time is when it starts to fuzz out see if you can increase your air speed if that makes it clearer mm -hmm. but also sometimes just recognize yeah no i think my mouth is tired now and it's better for building endurance to do short, frequent practice sessions. So often 15 minutes is our limit when we're trying to go higher. So you might do 15 minutes in the morning and then 15 minutes at lunch and then 15 minutes after dinner. And then you might get 45 minutes of the read, you know, the three sounding great. Whereas if you just did it all at once, it might not. So those are, those are things for you to explore, I think. Keep persevering. I'll put a question around reads then. There's still time. Yes, of course. Um, so I, I've been playing with the three, and then I tried with a, th well, a three of a different kind, and also three and a half. And although I could play on it, I, I, I liked the sound better. Not that I, not that my mouth got tired, 
And so my feeling is that harder isn't necessarily better. It's just a different kind of sound. Is that valid? Yeah, harder is not necessarily better. You have to go with what works for you and how you play and the reads, you know, the mouthpiece you have. Absolutely. And also the the sound you want to get, right? Because different Absolutely. music would want different kinds of sound. Is that generally, right? Yeah, generally people who play music where pitch is bending a lot, folk music or klezmer or jazz, tend to go with lighter reads because it's easier to do that. Um, sort of the hardcore, pure classical tends to go with stronger reads. Yeah. And hello, everyone. I realized I, I had my screen set, so I only saw five or six of you. So sorry for not saying hi to the rest of you. Um, we have about a minute left, according to the note that just flashed on my screen. Does anyone else have a quick question that I could answer? If so, just wave around or unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Question. Hi. Um, I've swapped from cane to synthetic, having watched several of your, um, you know, um, training modules and things which has been fine um, and I've moved up the strength which I've never managed to do so all of that I'm happy with but I've got one note which I cannot get it to sound right everything else is fine and it would be of course wouldn't it the B with all your fingers down okay so, and I'm just wondering if it's purely technique um, and, and you know I don't know do you know what uh, so I'm not going to be able to access this in the next minute, but Gwenda, watch the chat. I'm going to put a link to a YouTube video I did. The B key gets out of adjustment super okay. easily on clarinet, and I have a YouTube video on how you can fix it. Oh, right. I'll, I'll start describing it, but you know what? We're going to get cut off before I get too far. So, um, and I can't make myself big. I don't have those zoom controls, but here's what I'll say. I don't know if you can see me. Um, yes. But, it, when we push our B key, these two big keys go down together. And if they're not both closed, it's trouble. So you have to adjust it. So I'm going to try and post it. If I forget, send me an email, michelle at clarinetmentors.com. Okay. All right. But I'll try and post it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to see you all. Thanks for being here. I think we can go back to the main room now. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of today's session. Hello, everybody. Sorry, it took me a little while to, to figure out the technology to join you. One would think I would know this with all the Zoom that we've all been doing in the past year. Great to see you all. Hello, welcome. So I'm Michelle Anderson. Uh, I'm here to answer as many questions as we can in the next 25 minutes or so. So um, I think what might be easiest if you have a question is just kind of wave around and I will be happy to answer as many as I can while we're here. Um, who wants to go first? Brian, yeah, why don't you unmute yourself? So click on your microphone button. Right, you can, I think with Zoom, one can use the space bar on your keyboard for unmuting. Well, that's a good short. Uh, yeah, um, I am trying to prepare for a fellowship of Trinity College in London. And um, amongst the pieces I chose to play was the R.T. Shaw Clarinet Concerto which I know you know, includes an awful lot of glissandi. And I've been trying to learn using this, dropping the tongue in the back of the throat, et cetera, et cetera, with not a lot of success. When I work with only a mouthpiece, I can't seem to get more than a, a minor third change. Um, and so I'm looking for extra tips, perhaps a different approach or something. Okay, great. Yeah, so those um, glissandos, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's the effect where it kind of goes whoop, where, like a trombone slide does, right? Where we're sliding between pitch. Um, on clarinet, we do it with a combination of, of how we hold our jaw and the shape of our throat and oral cavity, and then sometimes sliding fingers off the keys too. So, uh, you know, Brian, I've experimented with this myself. I'm not very good at doing it just with throat and mouth, and I've tried lots of things, but Ricardo Morales has a great uh, video on it where he starts on just the high C, thumb and register key, and inside it's as if he imagines going e like a real aw sound. So the lower our tongue goes, the more the pitch tends to go down. 
And then once you get your tongue down, oh, you kind of imagine your voice going down into your throat. So it's almost like if you put your hand on your throat, and you guys could all do this, you speak uh, a syllable and try and make it vibrate lower. And when you can feel it going really low in your vocal cords, in your voice box, that's when your throat is really open and that's gonna help you explore that. So sometimes just doing it um, with just your throat first is helpful. Um, the other thing on some of those glisses that helps is just to find fingerings where you can do it a little bit with sliding your fingers too. And I'll just quickly address that. When we slide our fingers off, hopefully you can see my fingers here. Um, what I'm gonna do is, let's say I'm gonna go from the G sliding up to a C. I start sliding the bottom finger off, and when it's about halfway off, before it's all the way off, then I'm gonna start sliding the one above it. And when that's part way off, then I start sliding the one above that. And that helps me get that. That helps, it helps enhance what I'm doing with my face to get that kind of gliss in there. And you know, the shaw goes up to an altissimo G. Sometimes we can look for overtone fingerings. So Google overtone fingerings are the fingerings where we're not adding a lot of fingers that can help us when we're trying to gliss up too. Does that give you some ideas to work with? Yeah, fabulous. Okay, who else has a question? Wave around and so I can see that you have a question. Yeah, uh, Gil, I'm not, Gil, it says Gil, Northern Ireland. So I'm not sure what your name is, but that's, go ahead, ask your question. I'm Jill, and this is my daughter, Hannah. So, Hi, Hannah. Thank you very much for the videos you've been doing, because um, I've been using them to help me learn about the clarinet. And we've been using these here um, to dry out our clarinets. Are these any good? Well, that's a great question. So those are sometimes called pad savers. Um, I'll tell you what, my favorite repair person doesn't like those for a couple of reasons. He said they tend to like shed, leave little bits of fluff in the instrument. And sometimes that can keep a key from closing all the way. So my preferred um, type of cleaner is a silk clarinet swab. Uh, the silk tends not to get stuck. Let me just grab one. I'll just sort of show you what it looks like. Now, there's a new one I want to get my hands on that has a cord on both ends of it. So if it does get stuck, you really have something to grab onto. I don't know if, but anyway, a silk one, you know, kind of like this. Um, and Maury Bakun, who designs really high end clarinets, he recommends you swab about five times when you're finished playing, even if it looks dry, because it'll sort of get different bits of it each time you put it through. So a silk swab's relatively inexpensive. Um, BG makes a really nice one. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Thank uh, you. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. All right. I'm glad to see young clarinetists in the world, too. We need them. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have any questions for today? Just wave around. Um, yeah, Darren, why don't you unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've turned my mic on now. Um, yeah, um, I've just started going over the break and it's like when I go from like a G to like a C on the high break, you know, like G, the normal G to a C, is there like an easy way to go from, uh, oh, because it's like you've got to slam all your fingers on the minute you go from G to... Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, when we're relatively new to clarinet, we have to do that crossing the break, right? And it's one of the hardest things to do on clarinet. And unfortunately, it hits us pretty early on. So a couple things. A lot of it does have to do with fingers. And um, hopefully you guys can see me. I just don't have enough control to make myself super big. But if you put yourself on speaker view, you might see me bigger. Uh, so what we want to think of, just your expression, like, yeah, I got to slam my fingers down to make it work. That's kind of how we think of it because it's hard. And when it's hard, our body likes to do tension. We want to be in the habit of always moving our fingers very gently so that they're curved in the same shape if we had like a little hand puppet and that they only move about this much. So that G to C is only this much movement, which means I have to train myself when I'm playing open G to have all my fingers hovering over their spot. And the way that I practice this is I looked in a mirror and I just practiced that interval G to C. And at first I probably did something like this. 
And I would be lucky if I sealed all the holes. Sometimes I'd miss. But if I started by just even holding my clarinet like I'm doing now and just fingering it, I start to train those lighter habits. If there's a delay in the sound, it means some finger, or sometimes it's our left thumb, which is harder to see in the mirror, is not quite sealing the hole all the way. So we also just wanna look for, is there a finger that's just not quite covering the hole? Um, but that exercise just by itself, like if we do it about 12 times in a row, it, it, it take, you know, it's under a minute, you're gonna find it improves each time you do it. Any hard interval, if you're more advanced, we might be talking about some slur into the altissimo, but just taking an interval and, and repeating it, really listening to your air, making sure your fingers are gentle, can quickly improve it, and it starts to train our body to move differently. Um, Darren, does that give you some ideas to work with? Yeah, that, that, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And the last thing I would add, when we've recognized, oh, this is challenging, we also tend to back our air off. Like, not only do we smash, we back our air off, and it's super important that we also really keep the air blowing. And if our fingers are sloppy, we'll hear it. But at least then I can kind of know, oh, some fingers are coming down before the others. And then that gives me a clue that I can then figure it out. Okay, someone else who hasn't spoken yet. Jill, let's go for you. If you want to unmute yourself. Well, I just had a suggestion. I taught the uh, beginning clarinetists for many, many years in a school setting. And one thing, I don't know if you would recommend it, um, but I had them put their right hand fingers down already and then just start working on the G to C um, with only their left hand, you know, getting getting that coordinated. And then they say, oh, I can, so they can feel the note, you know, how it, how it feels to, to get it to come out and then gradually back away so that they're not always putting their right hand fingers down before they get to the, um, before they get to the seat. So I don't know if that's something you would suggest too. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. Any of what we call the throat tone notes, notes at the top of the clarinet, like our open G, our A or B flat, we can have any number of fingers down the right hand and any piece of music where you're going rapidly back and forth between G and C, you could keep your right hand down, but it also helps you train it. Um, the harder thing for a lot of people is A to B or something. And often it's because they're moving their index finger too much. So one more thing related to crossing the break is if you were just to play L O C and crack open the A key at the same time, this is not a real note, it's nonsense, but it gives you a sense of what part of your finger you should use when you do go up to A, so that when I go to A, I'm just rolling my fingers. What we tend to do is this, and that's gonna really slow us down crossing the break. So make sure your top index finger is barely moving. That's gonna help you as well. All right, any other clarinet questions? And then I also had, yeah. I'm sorry. I also had a question. Um, I went to the articulation breakout session earlier, and you just barely got mentioning um, double tonguing skills and also tonguing in the altissimo register. Do you have any tips for that? Sure. So I find that the higher I go on the clarinet, it's as though my tongue sounds more hammery on the reed. So there's something about the way it vibrates when we're playing a high note that will hear the tongue more. So the higher I go, the lighter I have to touch the reed. So, you know, an interesting exercise is just to kind of tongue your way up a scale, maybe just doing a long note and then four short notes, but notice as you go higher, you almost have to imagine your tongue moving less. And in general, we tend to hammer our tongue too much, just like we can hammer our fingers. So imagine that you're barely moving it. So even if you were just... If I'm not thinking of it, I'll try and keep my tongue the same. You'll notice it sounds heavier as I go up. It starts to get heavier and heavier. I have to respond to that by going lighter. So you can take your high C if you're playing in that range, thumb and register key. And just practice with the lightest touch. An interesting exercise, this is hard to do, but it's really fun, is um, this is my tongue hitting the reed. You um, push the reed shut and then open the reed 
but having your tongue still touching it. So it's like the reed is vibrating, you're still playing, it muffles your sound a bit. You just go back and forth and it starts to train your tongue to barely move. And then when we actually play, we just want it to lift off a fraction more. But that exercise, let's say, this is my tongue, would kind of look like this. I get weird sounds there, but my tongue is now tickled. It's just to practice that and then we lift it off. So the higher you go, very gentle. As far as double tonguing goes, that's where instead of our tongue coming forward, it comes forward and hits the reed and then it comes back and hits the roof of our mouth like we're seeing diggy 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 and some people do that with incredible speed and the theory is we get two for one for each movement of the tongue so that it's easier to tongue faster and usually if you're going to learn that start on something like an open g and just try slowly diggy again not hammering but try and get them to sound even and gradually speed it up and again the higher you go for double tonguing it also is going to feel a little more resistant so you kind of have to take a note or two do it um, just hanging out on one note so your body gets the feel of what works in different registers on the clarinet um, personally i think you can learn to single tongue super fast uh, so that in many cases you don't need to double tongue but there are some people who have phenomenal double tonguing so it's it is fun to experiment with yeah great question all right any other questions i know we'll have time for a couple more here Okay, Jamie, let's go for you, and then after that, Leonard. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a beginner, about six months, and um, my biggest problem is air support. So any tips you have for air support? And also, I'm just a bit confused by what it means to have your tongue high in your mouth. Okay, excellent. Um, so having our tongue high in our mouth, if we, I'll try and do this visually. Let's imagine like this is uh, <laughs> it's backwards on my screen. That's why I'm moving the wrong way. This is my mouth. So here's my windpipe. The air is coming up. It's going to go out of my mouth. Our tongue likes to hang out in the bottom of our mouth. If we're moving really fast air and it hits a wide open space, our air slows down. And so lifting our tongue high kind of makes it a bridge. So it helps us blow faster air into the clarinet. For most styles of music, especially a, a classical tone, we want our air to be extremely fast. So the problems we have with air support, I mean, we have to train our muscles how to do this. Even though you're exhaling all the time, to do it with the speed and focus we want for good clarinet sound takes training. And so what we want is really fast air. The best visual image I have is if we could see the air coming out of our mouth, it would be like water coming out of a hose. So if you have a, a garden hose with a spray valve on it, the normal way we blow out would be kind of like a fine mist. If I'm just standing here exhaling, there's this gentle spray of, you know, delicate droplets. For clarinet, we want the power wash. <laughs> Same amount of water, right? But I can, if I can put it in a really small stream, it has lots of force. And that force is what's going to activate the reed. Everything we do with embouchure and air is to get the reed to vibrate as much as we can. So with that image in mind, you can do some breathing exercises without your clarinet to, to help train those muscles. A really good one is just take a piece of paper, hold it at arm's length, make sure you're not cheating by, by bending your arm and you know try and blow it so it goes horizontally. And you can get dizzy doing this, so like make sure you take a deep breath. When we burst of air, like that, kind of notice what muscles you're engaging. And I encourage you to put a hand around your belly button as you're doing that. And you'll notice that there's some muscles down around your belly button that are engaging. We wanna add something for clarinet. And not everyone teaches clarinet this way, but I'll say my favorite performers in the world use this technique. So if it's new to you, I invite you to explore it. If we take our ab muscles and when we blow out, we think of pushing them out, it gives us more speed and more oomph. So um, here's an exercise I like to do. First, I do four huffs of air on the paper and try and notice what's moving. So I would just think three, four. And I'd go, oh, okay, something's moving down here. Then just to get these abs warmed up, I'm gonna push my abs out against my hand four times. Kind of like you're trying to make a big beer gut. One, two, three. 
four. It doesn't look very flattering, but hey, it's going to help us play clarinet. The, the key, the magic is when we combine those two. When I blow a burst of air out, I push my abs out at the same time. And that the first blow I did, it almost blew the paper out of my hands because it was so much more powerful than how I had been doing it when I wasn't thinking of that. So these bursts of air where we're pushing our abs out and blowing sort of help us be aware of what muscles we want. Then instead of doing short bursts, we want it to be a constant. While I'm blowing fast, fast air, I'm pushing out. And, um, you know, you could even, I have a lot of training exercises that don't sound good, but they help train us. We could take our open G, that's just like we put our clarinet in our mouth and blow that G, and play it with a hand on our abs and try and do those bursts of sound. It's gonna sound a little honky. What I'm trying to condition my body to do is get used to pushing my abs out when I blow. So that's a little honky sounding, but it's kind of conditioning the feel of our body. Then I wanna expand those into longer huffs. If I go for the, the spray valve on fine spray, I get this sound. You can hear this airy hiss. That's air that's wasted. It's going through the clarinet and it's not activating the reed. So if I use my imaginary spray valve to go, this is the sound. You hear how it kind of clears it up. So I have never met anyone who naturally does this without some practice in training and getting used to it. Another great exercise, you know, we could talk for two hours on air, but so important, it applies to all of us. That's why I'm taking some time on it, is then to try and take a note and go really softly. And the less air we have, just like you're washing your car and someone goes to the faucet and turns the water down, you have less pressure. When we're softer, we use less air, but we still need that speed. So we actually have to blow it even faster, just like someone turns the faucet down, you can still adjust your spray valve, and even though it's a smaller airstream, you still get some oomph to it. So as you're getting softer, you'll hear your tone fuzz out. At that point, I have to try and take that little air and refocus it. And doing that, it's these muscles pushing out that activate it. So as part of your clarinet practice routine, I always start, and you should always start with a couple minutes just on blowing to start to train yourself to blow faster and engage those muscles. Um, does that give you some ideas, James? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Okay. And Brian, I see you waving, but I want to try and get some people who haven't spoken yet. So Leonard, I had said, could ask his question. So Leonard, do you want to unmute yourself? We'll try and get one more question in here. Hi. Um, I recently, I appreciate your response to my comment about using a neck strap. I have a question about that. When you use, when you do it, do you let it hang where it normally hangs, where the strap is supporting all the weight, and then you just grab onto it and play, or do you move it out to get that 45 degree angle still? Everybody has a perfect angle that works for them. So with me, it's not 45, it's closer in. But usually, uh, because mine has a little spring to it, I have room to move in and out. I play a lot of chamber music where I have to cue people. So that's why I like the elastic key one. But yeah, generally I just have it set so I can pick up my clarinet and it's good to go. It's easy to tighten it or loosen it if I want to go further out. Um, but generally I just have my neck strap set at a setting. You're, you're letting the strap do all the supporting. You're not using any effort in your hands. With the springy one, there's slightly oh. more effort on my hands than, than with the rigid one, but it's probably taking over half the weight. Right. Yeah. In fact, I, I could just let it hang like this and it's taking all the weight. When my thumb is there, it's maybe holding a third of the weight, I would estimate. Okay, yeah. thank you. But neck strap's great for taking any pressure off your wrist. I had some tendonitis and it fixed it. And I always use a neck strap if I can. It really helps me. All right, I think we're going to get a 30 second notice any moment. We might just disappear. Melissa, quick question or comment? 
Yeah, um, I had a quick question. Um, so um, I'm returning, I'm hopefully going to be returning in the middle of this month after a break from an injury. And my question is, is um, I've heard about like scheduling and everything, but when you return, um, the type of music, like slow versus fast, how should you get back into it? Because I want to get back into the music I was working on. Should I just jump right back or should I kind of slowly ease into it by starting with easier music? Okay, we're all going to disappear in 20 seconds. So thank you all for being here. I would say, Melissa, just short, short, frequent practice sessions to get in shape. Definitely start with slow, long tone stuff, but there's nothing wrong with going into fast technique because you want to get your fingers back in shape too. But I would just keep everything kind of short and regular as you're building your muscles back up into shape. Yeah. Thank you.